we are doing the Amityville Horror. I'm so excited because this is... Have you... You watched the movies when you were a kid. I, have I you did. ever seen the original? Will you remind me... I, remind me who the star of the remake was. Because I'm... Was it... Um, oh, I don't think I ever saw the remake. Wasn't it like Ryan Reynolds or something? No, that's not possible. Um, no, no, no. That kind of sounds like... Wait a second. Hold on. Why am I thinking... What's his name? Um... Ryan Gosling, that's what yeah, I was imagining, but like that's somebody, also not right. I swear to God, I think it was Ryan Reynolds. Um, hold this on, this was 2005, so this is possible. Okay. Let's see. Um, it yes, was, it was Ryan right. Reynolds. <gasps> Look at that. Okay, so I remember seeing this and being really freaked, but I don't think it was a great remake from what I remember. Like, I think it was very. First of all, I didn't really um, get him as the. I just think he's so like likable and lovable in most of his roles mm-hmm. that playing that dad was like, I, it was hard for me to believe. But um, gosh, even even I wonder the, where this like fell in his career. I would love to see like I which know. movie came just before this. Yeah, I'm gonna look. But it up even right now. even though it was not, I think like a great movie. I mean, the story. One, it's it's again kind of like Zodiac. Once you're mm-hmm. watching it and you're like, oh, this is a horror movie, and then you realize, wait, wait, wait no, this happened in real life, no matter what, yeah. as bad as the story is or the production is, uh, that alone is enough for me to be on for the ride. <laughs> <laughs> well, I remember growing up watching the original and I was kind of fuzzy on it while doing this research. I was like, I'm not sure like which liberties were taken because I couldn't really remember like the full family dynamic, like what the kids were like. But I just remember, so it was a franchise when I was, Younger, obviously, I wasn't born in the seventies, but the original came out in the seventies. Contrary to popular belief, at the sound of my voice, but I remember the fourth. I think it was the fourth installment. Really, really freaked me out as a kid because I don't know if you've ever seen it. It's not one of the more popular ones, but it's basically a reiteration of the Amityville evil. Um, but in this version of it, the evil attaches itself to an object and that object gets sold at an estate sale which is a lamp and these like this older woman buys the lamp brings it into her home and then like her daughter and her kids move in after like a divorce or something and the lamp is like bringing this insidious energy i will never forget how scary that was to me as a kid that an object could hold like an evil presence Especially coming off of my like, <laughs> like mental warfare of talking about the possessed dolls and like being yeah. scared of my stuffed animals, the thought that a lamp was gonna like mess my Take shit you up, out. I was like, <laughs> yeah, I'm like, no, no. Well, it was too much. You know what it's like? It's like the monkey's paw. <laughs> that just made my I'm whole sorry. body recoil. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> it is the monkey's paw. <laughs> oh, the, the way that just like in two seconds of you saying that I had flashback. I know, that was one I of the, the things we did on tour years ago. Oh, God. Creepers. I, can, I can had we tell to. that story really quick? I, know, I had to. Story? <laughs> <laughs> Where do we even start? Um, well, we so we were in a show. We were in a tour. And yeah. one of the sequences or the short stories of the show was The Monkey's Paw, which is a piece of classic literature, right? Yeah. And... What was funny about it was that this was the most serious, like, story, I guess, of, like, the lot. And Stu played the mother, um, <laughs> where she has to find out that her son was just mangled in the machinery. And I played the factory man who came in in the middle of the scene to deliver this news. The problem with this scene was that I had a prosthetic mustache that was attached. Um, and if anyone knows anything about me, I sweat horribly especially during a two-hour show. So this mustache was a Russian roulette every day, whether or not this was going to stay on through the scene. I can't even... Like, I'm already full giggle mode right now. Wait, wait. But you have to tell... You you tell the rest of it, like, for when... Because I enter through the scene, this big dramatic entrance through, like, these French doors upstage. And And, and I never knew... I never knew if the mustache was going to be half off of your face or hanging on by a thread or fully on. I, it was always, it was a Russian roulette. So there was one performance where I opened it and it was literally halfway off of your damn face. And I, I, I broke. I mean, I 
fully broke, but I had the I I had the ability to I know. I had the ability to make my laugh almost seem like an insane cry of like terror did, because you had just told me my son died. I have never I mean, I just remember us rushing backstage to cry, laugh, like after the show was over because I just I, I where were we? We're in like I remember the theater where it was actually. Um I don't. I actually don't at all. That's it a complete was, It was blur. like not Oklahoma, but it was one of those like um it was a Midwest state. Um oh my god. I just remember <laughs> In my mind they all were Midwest states. Yes, yes. <laughs> Every yes. single one. Oh my gosh, it was just so funny. And then we had so many instances like that. We'll get back on track. But we had so many instances like that with that show. We had so many like little prosthetic pieces or glue on pieces. And we were running we did, around yeah. so much that the guys, like one of our friends had to wear a fake nose and it would just fall off. Like it fell off one performance because we were just, it was too too much sweating, too much running around, too many people playing Truly. too many parts. I had a wig that flew off during Sleepy Hollow <laughs> as Brom. My wig flew off, and that would have been a fabulous moment for, like, I don't know, a little relief for the audience that could have yes. laughed. Silent. Completely silent. <laughs> and I just picked the wig up and put it back on on stage. But I distinctly remember oh, those doors. Okay, this is my POV. Those doors open. And I'm facing the audience. I can't, like, hide or cheat or do anything because I'm just direct, like, head on center stage. And I look to you, and you're on my right facing upstage. And the second those doors open, your hand just goes to your mouth because you are about to collect. You're about to disintegrate in front of me. Because you know what had happened? Because at that point, it had happened enough times that the bit had been building and building and building. (laughs) And I just, that was the final straw for me was that it opened and we had been talking every performance about like, what if it really was just totally (laughs) off your face? And it was... Okay, was it partially on my face? Because the way I remembered it, it was, was the doors opened. It was. Okay. I think the doors opened and then the corner of it just dropped. dropped. So the mustache goes vertical to it my It was mouth. as if it was rigged. <laughs> it honestly was as if someone was holding it up with a string at the end and then they opened the doors and just let it drop. <laughs> and the thing is, the lines that like follow this are the most... <laughs> it's like horrible. It's like, your son was killed. And you're like... Herbert. And Herbert. I what a terrible acting partner I was to you because I I I knew you had a whole like monologue you had to launch into about how my son had died and I was like I I just I'm losing it. I'm losing the thread. No, there was no way I was going to come back. It was not you, I promise you. <laughs> I, because like you said the the bit was already built in. So if that mustache was going to go, oh, I was going to go. And then Tommy <laughs> joins in. Tommy starts laughing and I'm like this can't happen. I'm like, this is... Ho- We're literally talking about a dead child on stage, and all three of us are sobbing with laughter. <laughs> you also... Uh, real quick, I promise I'm going to get us back on track. I just need yeah. to tell the story so quick, because I'd be so upset if I didn't take the opportunity. You broke on stage one time. because So, in our show, <laughs> the show starts with a curtain speech. Stu was tasked with delivering this this horrible task to go out Which and do the curtain speech was in a so pantsuit. So silly. So silly when you look back on it. Why did they do that? I don't know, but anyway, sorry. It it must have been because of some horrible thing that happened when they ran this tour like I don't know in the early 2000s or 90s yeah. or something. Um but maybe like one really bad show. But Stu came out and <laughs> she knew that we were in the wings like watching her do this speech and so, like a funny thought must have entered your head or maybe you were just really tired. I don't know what happened. <laughs> But you got out there. Stan I think Center it's called stage. a psychotic break. I think it's what it was, it's called. It was the only visual I could imagine of a psychotic break because you came out. The ki- <laughs> they wouldn't shut up. The audience would not like pause for you. So you like brought your finger up to your mouth like shh, quiet. <laughs> you were shh, quiet. <laughs> I'm literally my palms are sweating as you're telling this. And you start the speech, but then a funny thought enters your head and you start laughing through the speech. And yeah. Cheyenne and I, we like perk up. We're like, oh, no. Oh, she's going. So we're, we're like watching you like start to break a little bit. But then you're trying so hard to be professional and get it back that you start like <laughs> muscling the laughter down, which turns into a cry. <laughs> So it was the most bizarre visual experience seeing you on stage. <laughs> Literally, your your 
your whole body is rigid. I thought I was going to get fired. I thought I was going to get fired <laughs> because I could not. It was one of those things where, again, the bit like we had been building up and building up like how freaking silly is it that you come out in that royal blue pantsuit looking like Hillary Clinton and deliver Hillary this Clinton. She's on the campaign trail. Speech. She's on the campaign trail with eye makeup out to my ears. <laughs> And because I have to be ready for the next like actual scene. It was just it was one of those moments I remember thinking to myself, like, this is so absurd that they have this in the show. And I couldn't get that thought out of my brain. I was just that that's where my brain was. And then I was like, oh, my gosh, like, get it together. Like, you're losing the plot in front of a thousand people. Like, (laughs) I definitely thought I was big. Some of those leaders were big. That was so unprofessional no. of me, but honestly, I I get where I was coming from. I do have to say, <laughs> no, I, I, I fully truth. understood. I was, <laughs> I was like, I feel what she's going through, but it was just the funniest <laughs> thing seeing you physically muscle through trying to get yourself together. Oh and at God. one point, it looked so wild that I turned to Shannon and I was like, <laughs> "Do you think she's okay?" I was like, "Should we should we tell Laura to stop the show?" Like it was we, we, those... we thought something was wrong. <laughs> like. And I think it was also at that point exhaustion. Like we had been on the road for so long and like I was just, we, we, do you know, I was actually talking about that with my mom the other day, the amount really? of manual labor that we had to do on top of doing a full, you know, five oh, God. weeks, I mean, five shows a week, like, or six shows a week, whatever, however many we did. And then just mm-hmm. all that manual labor on top of it. I mean, we were, thank God we were like young and chipper and honestly desperate Seriously. for work <laughs> because <laughs> whoa i know to think back on it i'm like i could never i could never do it again i mean even it's just painful enough like living out of a suitcase in hotels like i so many things i left behind and like because you would literally travel state to state like every single day like mm-hmm. if you left something in another state you weren't going to get it although i did leave my laptop in another <gasps> state you did I, I, I don't know if you remember this i left my mac and i was like laura I left my Mac. I'm like, I need to take the van to go get my Mac back in Kansas. Oh, I do remember that. Back in Kansas. That is... I don't even know if it was Kansas. It was some state. But I was like... It it was a state away was the the problem. And Monica, God bless her, was like, I'm going to come with you. And we drove like four or five hours through the night to go get my Mac. That is amazing. I mean, and because like, God forbid if we got off schedule or like got off track or something happened, like... Oh, God. Just too much. But, wow. The best memory, so. Oh, I know, I know. All right. I'm going to get us back on track. So Thank you for So, speaking of my psychological me. break, Amityville Horror. <laughs> <laughs> well, okay. So, this was, as I was doing the research, this was actually really informative for me because, like I said, I kind of loosely remembered the movie. So, like, that version of the story, um, I kind of had an idea about. I did not know much about the murders that it was based on. Did you? Like the origin story of the Amityville murders. I mean, I just know that the dad ends up going cuckoo, but I don't know so, like the origin of it. Well, so there's a few different things here. So there's technically like two insidious events that took place. There is that story that we know of, of the dad and the family, which is the haunting. But to have a haunting, you need ghosts. And before oh. that came just about a year before the grisly murders the amityville murders in that home it was a murder house they moved into that's right okay okay it's Mm -hmm. coming back to me a little bit yes yes so let's see where does the story actually begin of the amityville horror now like i said it was never clear to me and it had been years since i'd seen the movie so this was super informative um i really had to go back and do some deep digging and figure out like what was the origin of it all Um, because I knew it had something to do with, like, an evil presence. In the movies, I remember being, like, depicted as, like, demonic. Like, there's some evil presence that lingers within the home that infects an entire family. This is the legend or, like, the lore of the Amityville horror. And because there were so many revisions of this franchise, and like we said, there's a Ryan Reynolds remake, which, as I just looked up, it did fabulously in the box office, I must say. Did it? Well, Um, that makes sense. He was was so popular then, and yeah. 
it was a cheap movie. It was like it said I think like nineteen million to make it, and it made like over a hundred million. That's horror wow. movies like really turn it out because nobody ever spends big bucks on horror movies like budget wise, but they always have a huge box office draw. It's true. It's true. When we saw it, it made like eight hundred million dollars. How dare you That's... bring that up right now? <laughs> I know you're in a fragile state. <laughs> my my voice is literally trembling as we. <laughs> oh Lord! That was the first horror movie I ever saw with you. If you remember, I I oh I remember I remember because Creepers we went and we saw it. We were so freaked out, and then the very next day, walking down wherever we were at that point on tour, walking downtown and seeing a red balloon that float was out. That you cannot make that up. That was so crazy. It was like staged. I almost thought staged. someone in the cast was like Laura was like playing a prank on us or something because what so were the did odds? I. What were the odds? Oh god. So a weird. solo red balloon in the middle of the street. <laughs> I have that on video too and it turns to you and you go, "My heart is pounding." <laughs> oh. Oh. Oh god. <laughs> Okay, I'm jumping back in. So our story begins. This is the original inception of what went down at Amityville. Um, November 13th, 1971. It was supposed to be this very normal day in the neighborhood of Amityville. I was never like sure about like, is Amityville like a town? Is it a street? It is a neighborhood. It's set in Long Island, New York. There is 23-year-old Ronald DeFeo Jr., uh, who was also known among his friends as Butch. He reports into work at this Brooklyn car dealership, which his father actually also worked at. Now, from the jump, like the start of this day, it's kind of odd because his coworkers, they're like, they, they know his dad works there, obviously. And they're like, where's your dad? Like, where's Ronald Sr.? Um, because Ronald Jr. actually lived with his parents and his four younger siblings. So if his dad worked at the dealership, it was kind of strange that, one, he didn't show up without, like, no... No show, no call. Um, Or no call, no show is the actual phrase. But also, too, that, like, Ronald Jr. didn't seem to have an answer. (laughs) He's just like, oh, yeah, that is odd that my dad's not here. And they're like, don't don't you live with him? Like, were were you not aware that he he? didn't get up this morning? Yeah. It was strange. But they kind of just, like, brush it off. And they claim that he actually um, kept saying, he's like, oh, he's probably going to show up any minute now. And then even reports of him attempting to call home but not getting an answer. His father would never show. Now, according to the story, Ronald DeFeo Jr. would finish his work a bit early that day, but he doesn't return home just quite yet. He doesn't get back to Amityville. He goes and kind of jumps around town. He visits a few friends. And then that evening, he ends up going back home, again, to his story, saying that he hadn't heard from his family all day. And when he arrives home, he makes a harrowing discovery. The timestamp of this that is first reported is at exactly 6 p.m. where Ronald DeFeo Jr. calls his friend and sounds panicked and distressed over the phone claiming that he arrived home and found his entire family face down in their beds covered in blood. So all of the children, there's four of them, and both of the parents had been viciously murdered within that home. So police are eventually contacted. They race to this scene where they find Ronald shockingly already seems to have an inclination about the murders like he already has a story Uh, he claims that his father had ties to like a local mafia ring and that this could have been a hit on the whole family something along those lines and although the police consider this theory just for like a brief moment one of the eeriest tells about the scene that lets them know that something is amiss here is that the family members are all still in their beds in their pajamas from the night before So this was a bit of a, like, a conflict of schedule, the police realized, because they were able to determine that Butch, a.k.a. Ronald Jr., had left for work every day at about 6.30, and especially this morning, according to his statement. This is a time when the entire family would have already been up and out of bed. So it didn't make any sense that they were all found shot in their beds, in their pajamas, you know? They never got up. Um, It also seemed suggestive that they were not killed in the morning, but sometime through the night, Ronald would have been home. He would have been alert and he would have been aware of his entire family being shot to death in their beds. <laughs> so they're like, okay. The other suspicious find, which kind of seals this for them, is the discovery of a box in Ronald Jr.'s room, which could fit a thirty-five caliber Marlin gun. 
which was linked to the exact murder weapon that the family was suspected to have been shot with. So the picture seemed clear as day. Ronald DeFeo Jr. murdered his parents and all four of his younger siblings for an unknown reason. Hmm. That was a part of the story that I think I had missed because it's, I think so much of the story of Amityville is always centralized around it's the father, it's the father, like something about insidious energy with the father. It was the son of yeah. this household who killed an entire family. <clears throat> Did you know so, that at all? So I, this is coming back to me now. So the movie version or like the, the horror movie versions that we know, it's mm-hmm. more about the family that then moves into the house and starts experiencing exactly okay yes. okay it is, but this is the it is origin purely about story. the haunting this is the origin of the murders the origin yes. of the haunt we could say okay and this is sort of coming back to me yes i i, I remember i remember it being now the son came in and killed everybody because i feel like there's something about him like telling people that he thought he killed them or something i don't know why that's well, he does eventually admit to it. So this is when it gets into the questioning phase, because once they start to realize, like, there are a few puzzle pieces that are connecting here, a few dots, they're like, um, this is shaping up that this kid killed his entire family. So they bring Ronald into the interrogation room where they begin to question him. He starts to spiral. He has, like, an ever-changing story um, over the course of a day, essentially. And then the following morning... It hits, and he reportedly has a full breakdown, and he just admits to everything. So it doesn't take very long. This is not, like, a, a very, like, uh, lengthy process. Ronald DeFeo Jr. murdered his own family in that home. That is clear. According to his story, which still changes a bit after he admits to this, his father was a deeply controlling um, person who ruled that house um, without any exception. He would expect complete obedience from his family. And although the story, like I said, changes a few times, there's even an admission of plans that he had to rob the dealership prior to the murder. So it kind of seemed like he was concocting a grander plan that he would steal a bunch of money so he could go on the run, kill the entire family. I don't know why he would kill the entire family if he just had this issue with the father. But obviously, this is not a person who's well. (laughs) But the motive just seemed like senseless, if not egregious, like I said, to kill an entire family. According to his confession, in the middle of the night, before the morning, as this would make sense because they were all found in their beds, it's the morning of November 13th, very, very late at night, Ronald DeFeo Jr. crept through the dark hallways of his home carrying the thirty five caliber gun and fired at each one of his family members in their separate rooms as they slept because this was a six-bedroom home. What I found odd about this was that from everything that was described in the reports of the scene of the crime, that was true. Like, his story lines up, but that never made sense to me. How you could shoot people one at a time and nobody would wake up from their sleep? Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Oh, I was just thinking that. And that sounds like... How did that happen? (laughs) I don't know much. I, I mean, that's not a shotgun, is it? No, but it's it's certainly not a gun that's muffled. You know, it's not yeah. like a silent a silent shooter. Like you would hear. Well, actually, I don't know. I I actually did not look up what the gun looks like. I figured a thirty five millimeter or thirty five caliber rather was not a shotgun, but I actually yeah. don't know. It's not. I don't think it is. I don't think it is. I mean, I don't know much about guns, but because I, if it was a shotgun, for sure, you'd be like, how in the world did he do that without people waking up? Um, yeah, like people but would still, be. They, they would yeah. be up and like maybe out of their bed or you there would be some evidence that they like I don't know, were like turned over facing the door. They were all like face down in their beds or like on their side. Like they were sleeping. Yeah. So this is where some of the like the insidious legend comes in that he was compelled by something darker. Um because we, we never understood how he was able to fire a gun six separate times and not a single person wakes up or like moves throughout the room like they're all found in bed Mm -hmm. at times he said his father's incessant demands drove him to insanity but other occasions he talks about hearing voices in the house that coaxed him into the murders and even helped him would guide him and this eventually shifts into claims that there was a demonic spirit within these walls that asked him to murder them that helped him through the process uh so the simple, you know, colonial home at 1112 Ocean Avenue became this pillar of horrific spectatorship after this because this was an incomprehensible murder 
to take place in the 1970s, like in a quiet suburban town. This was, it was gruesome. It was horrible. The news of these murders was a national headline at the time, but shockingly, these murders, like I said, were not quite the origins of what we know of, of the Amityville hauntings, what the whole franchise is based on. The legends of the hauntings within this home would come after Ronald DeFeo was sent to prison. So before I jump into that story, any just strange, I mean, thoughts about that, because it's strange, it's odd. I find the the murder circumstances to be strange, but I also find this early touch point of reference to the demonic within the home to be strange. Yes, the demonic and and the fact that <clears throat> they were all asleep is what I think mm-hmm. is really, I think that's the part that like twists your gut a little bit is that yeah. people were kind of like, I mean, obviously they were all helpless. They, they didn't have a chance to react. And it does feel like there's almost this like sleepwalkery element that he just like walked in and was like, boom, boom, like boom, a trance, like, boom. Yeah. Something yes, like a trance. Him. Yeah. Like he was in a trance sort of, um, Oh God. And, and to be, it's chilling. How old was he again when he did this? He was 23. Uh, like to be that young and to do that. I mean, ooh, yeah, scary. It's very, uh, yeah, scary. I, I'm, Curious because while looking up, I mean, this was the 70s, so maybe these evaluations were not as common, but I never found anything about, like, whether he had a psych eval or whether he was diagnosed with any kind of schizophrenia, specifically from him saying, I heard voices. I don't think I ever saw that anywhere in the reporting. So maybe it was just omitted for the sake of, like, I don't know, journalists trying to tell an insidious story. Yeah. And, you know, create, like, an, an air of supernatural, but... So following that, we we have the trials of Ronald DeFeo Jr. for the murder of six family members in that home. So the home sits dormant and dilapidated um, as like a dark omen within the city. Like nobody wants to touch it. Nobody wants to get near it. That place is dark. So it's put on for sale. But being the subject of a national murder case, you can imagine that nobody wants to buy it. Um, It's actually wild to think this. And I I wrote this down because I wanted to ask you about it if you know anything about this. But... A lot of homes do not have to disclose if there was a homicide in the home when it's put up for sale. In California, or maybe L.A. specifically, there is a law, which I was reading about, where if a homicide took place within a home or an apartment that is for sale, I think even for rent, it has to be disclosed to the potential renter or buyer for a minimum of five years following the murder. Wow. Um, (laughs) You're saying that's just California? I think it's it may even be Los Angeles specifically, but because okay. LA has wild laws like that where yeah. <laughs> rich people are like, I don't want to live in a murder house. I know, I know. Fair. Yeah, I you know I don't know because I'm trying to think about too like if if somebody commits suicide in a home, do they have to disclose that? I feel like I've heard that. I don't think they do. Okay, I because I think I've heard you don't have to you know disclose that but i guess yeah homicide is a different story um i can attest to that actually from the home that my family lives in now (laughs) we found out some really we found multiple things we found out some really insidious things about the home we live in mostly from other people like my sister's friends and people who would come over they're like you know what happened in that house right and we were we've lived there for like over 10 years we're like no because we've never had any like bizarre paranormal experiences in there but there was a fire in the home in the 80s that, like, burned a little boy who lived there, like, severely burned, marred for life. Oh, my God. Um, and then their, the family grandmother died in that home. But people die in homes all the time, like, of yeah. natural causes. But I think, I'm not 100% certain, but I think the wife took her own life in, in our home. Oh. We learned this 10 plus years after living there, like playing board games, making Pillsbury floss and bakes, <laughs> like not to make light of any of any suicide, but I have yeah. to give us some levity because I can't, I, we can't be that kind of pod, but that really shook us hard. I'm sure. Oh my gosh. Um, I don't think Nobody I, I'm disclosed that. Back. I don't think, yeah. I mean, I don't think I've ever lived in a house. I mean. It makes it makes me curious now because I know that the house where my parents live now it is an older mm-hmm. home, and I know it was built and only ever inhabited by one particular family, and like they lived there for generations, and their names are actually carved into like oh. so many parts of the house. Like, I mean, I hope there isn't anything insidious, but it would be very trippy, like 
later on in my life to learn that things yeah. have, like something wait this is a dark there. question do you think anyone's buried on the property because that was common back then well you know that my my uh farmhouse in virginia my family's farmhouse there were bodies buried in the back you have a farmhouse in Virginia? <laughs> okay, this is so <laughs> this sad. This is the first time I, I'm hearing of yeah, this. Wait, this is so sad because my dad literally just sold it like a couple of weeks oh. ago. But he sold it to somebody that is still within our family, which is really nice. Um, but gotcha. yeah, this was a farmhouse that was built. I think my great-grandfather bought it from a family um, back in like maybe the 40s or 50s. But the house itself was built in the late 1700s <laughs> and so oh, that's haunted that's... haunted and you'd walk in the back i remember i'll never forget visiting it for the first time it's like this beautiful house mm. super long driveway and we drove up and we're so excited we'd like been hearing about this house forever and my little brothers and i walked around to the back of the house and we looked and we saw three gravestones <laughs> and we were no. like um okay and then i went up and i looked and one of them was like really tiny and my dad was like, yeah, that was for probably a baby that died. And I was like, okay, this is chill that we're just, <laughs> this is. Of course you went up and look, you go straight to the back. You're I like, went straight I to, to the to, graves. Go. Straight to the graves. Oh um, uh, well, that's a lot of older houses like that. Mm-hmm. I would be surprised to hear a home that was built in the 1700s or 1800s if it didn't have somebody buried on the property. Because it, yeah. even back then it cost money to be buried in a cemetery. And not yeah. all families had that kind of like flexibility in their totally. their income, their stability in their income throughout the year. I don't know. I'm definitely thinking that hopefully nobody is buried at my parents' house because I, I can't take that. I can't go there. <laughs> no, it's too much. <laughs> Jack too also much. Uh, grew up in a home that was much, much older, and they found out, like confirmed history, like through records, found out later that there was some insidious history where one of the... It was owned by two brothers who, like, lived together because they were two farmers. But as the story goes, it's not confirmed. One of the brothers killed the other one, I think, for, like, sleeping with his wife or something, and buried him beneath the house. Like, this was, like, the the body being buried beneath the house was confirmed. Like, somehow they were able to trace back that that's true. Like, the brother is buried on the grounds. Oh my so God. Amityville is a different thing for sure. <laughs> um, but still something grisly went down within these walls. So yeah. I'm going to get into like the actual lore of the haunting when okay. that all begins. So following the trial and the sentencing, the home, like I said, sat without interest for a very long time. The price would continue to plummet. Imagine being the real estate agent on this case, on this oh. home. <laughs> yeah. So the summer of 1975 rolled around. Um, This is nearly like a full year, I think, following like the closure of the case, like of the trial. Um, So the realtors who were assigned to the property, they knocked the price down to $80,000, which would have been roughly $371,000 today, I looked up, which is not as cheap as I thought. No. I was like, for God's sake, I'm like, for a home where six people were murdered, I would expect like... (laughs) Like, I'm going for less than a hundred thou. Like, you know, those New York real estate agents are gonna, (laughs) they're, they're gonna get their money's worth. Okay. Yeah. Well, I mean, I, I I guess I never realized how big the house actually is. Um, it's a a beautiful house. It it kind of is. Yeah. So it's, it's not as cheap as I was expecting. Um, and in the movies, they depict it as like dirt cheap. Like they really like sell the story on like the extreme end of the spectrum. Yeah. Um, But the house was a six bedroom home, three and a half baths. And it was so big. It was a mansion, really a colonial mansion. It had a boathouse and a swimming pool. I don't remember any of that. I definitely remember the boathouse because from the movie, there's a very specific scene. I remember um, with the boathouse. Well, that's like the first part of this this story, like how this goes. But I don't remember anything about the boathouse. But reading about it, this is when I was like shaking last night. This is the part of, I can't live alone. I'm so nervous. I can't do it. And people always message me. They're like, how do you like look up these stories when you're alone? I'm like, because I'm never alone. I was alone. Now you're alone. So what actually, who are the characters who jump into this story? We have the newlyweds, George and Kathy Lutz. Those are the characters I remember from the movies. Now, the couple stumbled upon the home, which was more than enough space to fit them and Kathy's three children from a previous marriage. This included nine-year-old Daniel, seven-year-old Christopher, and five-year-old Missy. This, if I'm remembering correctly, 
I thought was different from the way the movie depicted them. I don't, I thought it was all girls for some reason, if I'm remembering the movie, but maybe I'm wrong about that. Do you remember? I don't remember. Um, maybe they were just boys in the seventies with long hair. Yeah. (laughs) I, I that does kind of sound familiar though. Um, Mm, I, I can't, I can't remember. Well, they do come, you know, they see the house, they want it. And even though it's, you know, a mansion and it's marked down considerably, it's still kind of out of their budget. Like they cannot swing 371 K, but they recognize how good of a deal this is from like a real estate perspective. That's their thinking. Um, so they find a way to stretch their budget. They get the mortgage and they make the fateful decision to move into 1112 Ocean Avenue. And so begins the legend of the Amityville hauntings. Any quick thoughts on that just before I'm going to jump into what actually happens when they move in? Because it's a very short period of time that they're actually in the home. No, but I'm so scared. (laughs) (laughs) So when originally, I think when they had first toured it, like this is just before they bought it, even the realtor was like trying to throw them a bone. And she's like, you know why this is marked down, right? Like, this is the DeFeo house, just so you're aware, because it seems like you're very interested. She's like, I feel obligated to tell you that before you make this huge financial decision. But according to the real estate agent, they were apparently aware, both of them, and kind of unfazed by the horrors that took place in that home like a year before. It's not clear why. They just wanted the deal, and they really wanted the space for their family. Um, So the Lutz family, they move in, and beginning just on night one in this home, things feel off. So one of the most prominent things that I remember from the movies as a kid was the timestamp of 3.15 a.m. I would al- They would always show that, and I would oh, clock yes, it. I'm I like, 3.15 yes. a.m., that's an evil hour. So according to George, on the very first night in the home, he woke up at 3.15 sharp for an unknown reason and was compelled to get out of his bed. Everyone else in the house is asleep, like Kathy's asleep. While walking the halls of the home in the dark, he was captivated by this like confusing and alarming sound of like a tapping that was coming from inside the walls. It sounded, in his description, it sounded like a person moving through the walls and tapping them as they would shift through, like just going like tap, 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 and then moving tap, tap, tap. It was like an impossible thought, but he's enamored by this and trying to rationalize like what what the hell am I hearing? Like, what is the logical explanation for what that could be? Is it like pipes? Is it dripping or something? Is it heat? While figuring this out, he's suddenly startled by the sound of the family dog, which was kept outside, which also seems very seventies. Um, and the dog is going ballistic, like barking nonstop. So the dog is seeing something in the yard. George rushes to the window where he sees something that he can't explain. He sees the dog facing towards the boathouse past the swimming pool, where he described seeing some kind of a figure move through the yard very quickly and towards the boathouse. So again, thinking logically, he's assuming home invasion. Like, there's an intruder who's on our property. He grabs his jacket. No fear. I don't know how, I don't know how people do this. Storms downstairs and out to the, through the back door, straight towards the boathouse to confront whoever's on his property. He's going to get them. Only when he gets there, he's disturbed to find that there is no one in any direction, but the door of the boathouse has been swung completely open. So this was the moment, again, where he's rationalizing to the obvious. He chalks it up. He's like, you know what? It's got it's heavy winds. I'm just tired. It's three in the morning. The wind blew the door open. The dog got startled. And he's like, the winds were probably the reason for the noises in the house. Like, it's probably like creaking or like the house settling. And I'm just hearing that. So he doesn't think anything of this, but me and you being (laughs) the paranormal piranhas we are, (laughs) the dog always knows. Uh, If a dog is barking, the dog knows. The dog knows. (laughs) What would you do if you had this experience? Just curious. What would you do, Stu? (sighs) I would be like, get inside. (laughs) Get the dog and be like, get on in. Um, I I would be up the rest of the night. I do know that. I would be sitting. I, I would get my sleep. entire no family. I would get them up and I would get them all around me. And we'd go. We would do 
like we'd we'd get in the basement like a tornado is coming is what we would do oh my god no the basement is even more insidious i guess at least from what i remember in the movies the movies really take this to like another level but george does not think much of this like it's just night one he's like it's initial paranoia i'm just settling into a new home He's like, it's 3.15. Like, I was probably, like, in a haze from sleeping. Who knows what the hell I saw. It's nothing until the following night when, once again, George unexplainably wakes up at exactly 3.15 a.m. And he described this feeling of uneasiness because there was nothing he could blame on, like, the sudden wake-up call. Like, there were no noises or, like, there was no tapping or dog barking. Like, he just shot up out of bed at 3.15. This witching hour. I don't think that's the actual witching hour, but it is a spooky hour. So there's no noise coming from the house. No dog. He's feeling a sense of paranoia. But even so, he goes downstairs and he goes out to the boathouse again in the dark just to prove to himself that he's being ridiculous. But this pattern would continue. During the first week in the home, every single night, George was consistently waking up without a cause and looking at the clock, 3.15 a.m., But shockingly, his skepticism, like, breaks fairly quickly, I guess, in this case, because he knows the coincidence of waking up at this hour is not normal. And he even begins to suspect, in his words, what if this had something to do with the murders? Like, he remembered that, like, some of the things that he had heard about the killings taking place in the middle of the night while the DeFeo family slept. So he kind of deduces from this, from those stories, that 3.15 a.m., was significant to that. This was the exact hour when when Ronald DeFeo Jr. got out of bed, walked through the halls of the home with the gun, and killed his family. Within these first few weeks, it was not just George silently noticing the strange occurrences in the home. Kathy and the kids were also experiencing and exclaiming this um, phenomenon of cold spots throughout the home, like this rush of unexplainable chill air that would race past them and they could not get warm in this home. Like they would have the heat on. This is something I also remember, like them thinking the heat was broken and it was just freezing in the home always. There was also this family fixation on a ceramic statue of a lion that I was reading about, which I did not remember. This statue in the home seemed to unexplainably be moving to different locations throughout the home, but nobody was taking credit for moving it. And the family would find it, like, in completely separate rooms, like, of the home. Despite everyone being like, I didn't touch it. Like, I didn't move that. I don't know who's moving it. So Kathy, you know, begins to feel suspicious. And she's like, you know what? It's got to be one of the kids. Like, it's probably Daniel or something playing a prank and just being an ass. Until one night, she's alone with that thing in the living room, sitting on the couch. And she sees it with her own eyes. And her description The ceramic statue slowly moved across the floor just a few inches right in front of her. She saw that thing move by itself. For me, this would have been the end. (laughs) I (laughs) Yeah. I I probably would have gone to my local Super 8. And I think it would have been a wrap for me. It's a wrap. Um, Would you feel differently? (laughs) Are you trying to conjure? (laughs) No, I just have so many questions about like, I wish I could remember what, and I don't Mm. know if this is part of your research, but kind of like what their uh, jobs were, or was she just a stay at home mom or or what their relationship was like? Um, You know, I feel disappointed in myself. I didn't do a lot of research (laughs) on their backstory. I know that they were not, they were not wealthy. So if they did both work, they definitely did not have a ton of money. I can't imagine that George got this mortgage all by himself. I kind of vaguely remember from the movies that he was like a, not a woodsman, like a crafty, he, wasn't he always chopping wood? Yeah, he was. I feel like, if, okay, this might not be correct, but there's almost a part of me that remembers that like their marriage was, like they weren't the strongest when this started happening. So like, I do kind of wonder if, you know, if I'm Kathy and I see this lion moving across, mm-hmm. if I stay because... Like, there's a kind of a vulnerability there with her where this is, like, something she can fixate on, like, somewhere to direct the, like, problematic energy that's, like, going on that they can kind of, like, point to yeah. this, like, paranormal experience that's happening or – and it's kind of, like, not, like, giving them something to do, but it's, like, it kind of becomes 
something in a really weird way. Like you can start to bond over like these like hauntings and weird experiences you're having. I don't know. No, I think because I can't imagine where you stay. Well, George was also reportedly abusive, too. And if it was a scenario where Kathy was not working, she was a stay at home mom and George was the breadwinner and he's abusive and they just don't have a lot of money because they've already stretched their budgets to the limit here. Like whatever her savings might have been or anything like that. It it makes sense, I guess, like because that's what we talked about in the last case. Um, Or I was talking about this with the Enfield poltergeist. Yeah. Everybody always assumes they're like, just get up and leave. It is so rarely that simple that people can yes. abandon their homes like it's so impossibly ridiculous to me nobody does that nobody can do that yeah and um especially if you're in an abusive relationship <laughs> like absolutely you're not going anywhere yeah so i she also may have been grappling with like what she was even seeing i mean my first instinct yes. i saw that I don't even know if I would think it was paranormal. I would think, well, damn, it's it's really happened. I'm going insane. Exactly. I'm hallucinating. That's wow, actually it's, why it took I this just, long. I, I just paused because I lost my train of thought. That's exactly what I was going to say. Was that like I would be wondering if I'm losing the plot a little bit and if I just need to go back to sleep, you know? Yeah. Or maybe just like, oh, yeah, exactly. Like overtired, like you're up late in the living room and like you thought you saw something that didn't actually happen. But this would mark, I think, one of the, the earliest experiences, because like I said, this actually doesn't go on for all too long. I think in my mind, this was like years of them in this home. It's like a month. <laughs> they spent like a month there where this all goes down. Doesn't it seem longer? Yeah. I mean, just based on the sheer amount of... uh like movies that they had in the franchise. I would think it would be longer I'm than like, a month. God, you guys really stretched 28 days out, didn't yeah. you? Yeah. Damn. Writers. But wow. I mean, if there was something insidious in that house, it came to light very quickly. Oh, night one. Absolutely. But yeah. like I said, this would mark one of the most prominent visual experiences that Kathy had in the home. One of the more notable that I was reading about, which I think you would find terrifying. And this is where like, it kind of plays into like her own paranoia that she's hallucinating. Um, there's an incident where she's sitting by the fire in the living room with George one night and the clock strikes midnight. And when it does, she looks to the fire because she notices something moving in the fire. Her eyes dart to the the fireplace um, where she described an experience of what she said was like ash and um, I don't know, like burning wood, like assembling into a figure of like a devil with horns, like a fi- a figure within the flames of the fire. She saw this, experienced this visualization, and it felt so real that it then came out of the fire and lunged towards her. So she like flips back in her chair screaming. George claimed he was with her the entire time. He didn't see anything. Which I also think is interesting because there are a lot of people who like, you know, conspire like, oh, they made it up. And I'm like, yes, yeah. well, then why are why would they tell stories where they're like, we weren't on the same page or seeing the same thing? Like, why are they telling conflicting stories if they're both making up a lie? You know? Yeah. I mean, part of it could be also that if they're in like an abusive relationship, like it gives him a little bit of power to be like, I'm not seeing that. That's true, too. Yeah. Like, maybe you're just crazy. Yeah. Like trying maybe to make he, her maybe they didn't nuts. even want to believe that if they just spent all this money on this home. Like maybe totally. they didn't want to believe that something insidious was going down. But let's talk about the children. Because you know the ghosts always go for the children. Uh, of course. Always the vulnerable spirits. As I said that, I visualized myself as Angelica Houston and the witches. <laughs> children. <laughs> oh my god. One of my favorite movies ever. Me oh, too. So oh, good. that's gotta be my Halloween costume next year. <laughs> that or Margaret Hamilton, the actress. <laughs> Why not both? There are several parties I'll be attending. <laughs> well, one of the scariest memories that I can remember on the topic of the children from the movies was the topic of Jody. Do you remember Jody? <sighs> I don't. Oh god. Okay, so Five-year-old Missy, um, this is like her first week in the home, she started to talk about an imaginary friend she had met within that home on the first day named Jody, and she described Jody as a pig. Now, the family didn't think much of this claim because little kids have imaginary friends all the time until this one incident. <clears throat> While putting the kids to bed, Kathy is tucking in Missy when she looked to the window and she screamed. 
George rushed into the room just long enough that he could actually catch this, like catch sight of it and verified it before it moved away from the window. The sight of a pig's face in the window of the bedroom <gasps> with red eyes oh, staring back I at can't, them. I can't. When I read I can't. that, deep, horrible, full body chills, my stomach hurts. Like, I can't. That's so that's so specific and yes. eerie. Like, yes. It's not a ghost. It's not like a scary person's face. It's a pig. What and, the hell? And like little girls don't just come up with an imaginary friend that's a pig. It's normally like a princess or like, it's something a little bit lighter. It's not a pig. Little known fact, this is the inception story of Peppa. Peppa Pig. <laughs> this is where the inspiration came from. <laughs> Sorry. Actually, that's that's the next that's the next just foul like because didn't they do a Winnie the Pooh horror movie recently? That's going to be the next one. They the did Peppa Pig horror movie, and I'm gonna I'm gonna I, try, I tried to do a it. brand deal for it, and they didn't want me. <laughs> they you were did like, not. We don't need for the Winnie you. the Pooh thing. Absolutely, I am dying. That is too. The check cash is the same, even... honey. <laughs> <laughs> How would you have even done that? I'm I'm. Are dead. you kidding? <laughs> the brands that, that's that's a horror movie. Like the brands that come to me and they're like, we'd love to do a spooky story, and it's like Clorox, and I'm like, let's go. Let me get my pen and paper. <laughs> let's come up with something. <laughs> that's easy. Um, I've done like back to back horror movies and series this month. It's been crazy. I did Saint X. I did um, Cruel Summer. Uh, no, I believe I, you do the horror movie brand deals. That makes sense. But the Winnie the Pooh, I just, I'm, I'm so, <laughs> I would be so curious to see how you would have how you would have narrated that how you would have woven that in because i feel like you do scary you do such a good job i think with like like the you'll do like the build-up and then it like the drop at the end like i think it's Mm -hmm. a real story but with winnie the pooh i would have (laughs) just lost my mind Uh, i did one um recently for the pope's exorcist and it was through uh sony and they i I saw the email uh chains and they wanted me to do a jump scare video (gasps) where like uh, halfway through me talking like the lights flicker and then it's like a huge like jump scare of like a scary like possessed person's face and i followed up with them and i was like i think this could get taken down (laughs) like this seems a little like over the top and they were like no no it's not they, they were, like, going balls to the wall. They had no <laughs> no issues whatsoever. And I was like, are you sure this is brand? Like, I'm the one being like, is this brand safe? And they're like, do it. Like, do it. <laughs> and Throw as I said. That pig. Throw up that pig's face. <laughs> the check clears the same. <laughs> they all clear the same. So almost, um, <laughs> let me get back to the, this pig. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so as soon as they all see it, it vanishes from the window. Shocking, scary. I'm throwing up, terrifying, can't handle that. Um, But again, they're stuck. Like, they're all acknowledging at this point, like, they're having experiences in this home. Like, children, Kathy, George, they cannot sell the home. No one is going to buy this house from them, given the history. Like, so they would just, they're kind of stuck. Like, they just continue to experience these incidents, which seem to get worse and worse and much darker. On one instance, Kathy was alone, I think in the kitchen, writing her grocery list, um, when suddenly she felt the presence of someone watching her within the room, which is a very real thing. Everybody feels that when you're being watched. Um, It must be an evolutionary thing. Yeah. But she gets this feeling, and then there's the unexplained smell of a woman's perfume in the room. That's very specific, too. It's so weird. She described this feeling of, like, a wrapping pressure around her chest, like, almost like someone was hugging her from behind. But it became tighter and tighter until she starts gagging from the pressure as if, like, someone was hugging her so tight that she was literally, her, like, chest was collapsing. So she just couldn't explain it and she starts screaming and runs from the room. Another experience going on is that George seemed to have this intense reaction one time at church. So I think the family went to, like, a wedding or something. And this is depicted in the movie um, where George... George. George goes inside the church. (laughs) George George. is a great name. (laughs) And he receives communion, but becomes violently ill. Like, vomit, dizziness. Like, he, it's as if nothing sacred can be tolerated within his body. Kind of possession style. So these experiences uh, within each family member seem to intensify, as did the conditions of the home. 
on one of the instances, an unexplained scent of rotting foods and mold swelled throughout the house midday, and nobody knew like where this was coming from. It almost smelled like what they could imagine and what they were describing as like decomposition, yeah. which is kind of loosely the smell of like sweet rotting fruit from what I've read. Ugh. The family rushed throughout the house to open up all the windows. Even the kids, they're like, open up all the windows. This smells horrible. Um, now, reportedly, Daniel, this is the nine-year-old, opened a window in one of the rooms, and then it was forced shut on his fingers and held there. Now, George and Kathy rushed in, and this was shown in the movie. He's screaming. They could not get the window open. Like, something was holding it down, crushing this kid's fingers. And by the time they did pry it back open, Daniel's fingers were flattened. So he then described the sensation, later, even later on in life, like like uh, giving recounts of the story, looking at his fingers, which were flat, and in his words, they reinflated as if it never happened. And I, I, there's like a slew of incidents that go down in this house, but like I said, all of this happens in a 28-day 20 period in this house. That is so short. What a condensed period of time yeah. for so much of a haunt to go on. So much of a haunt and so many really odd haunts. Very odd yeah. and very specific haunts. It's, well, in a bizarre description um, of one of the most haunting incidences of, you know, all of their experiences, it's unclear if this was something that was, I don't know, dreamt, hallucinated, or if it really happened or from what George was describing. But he says that he had this experience one night. This one really messed me up bad last night. He woke up in bed. Again, this is around like late at night. It's like 1 a.m. And Kathy is out of bed. And she is standing in the room, staring at the mirror at herself in silence. Almost like she's not conscious, like she's not awake. And she didn't seem to be saying anything. She wasn't aware of what she was doing. She's just looking at herself blindly. And then he describes seeing a figure in the room that came from the door came towards him and crawled into bed with him. He <sighs> said that this experience was so terrifying, he j he remembers fading into unconsciousness out of fear. Like he passed out. He then woke up to what he said were the boys in his room in tears, screaming, claiming they saw a faceless person in their bedroom. So it's then described that he jumps out of bed, runs to the hallway, uh, where he was stopped dead in his tracks because uh, he found the family dog in the hallway facing towards the dark end of the hallway where the stairs were, straight to the boys' room, just growling in that direction. Mm. Facing in that direction is a set of stairs, like I said, up to the top as his eyes adjust and he looks to the top of the stairs and sees a figure standing there wearing a white hood as it slowly lifted its arm and pointed directly at George. I would go to the red roof at this point. I, I would pack it standing, up for real. Like I'm just, I'm just literally like shaking my head right now as you're saying all this. Like I can't even. I feel paralyzed as you're saying it, which I think it's too maybe much. it's too much. Maybe <laughs> it does indicate like you become so freaked out that you don't know where to go. Like you, you are literally paralyzed with fear. Like maybe that's why they just kept sticking around i don't know or you just keep well, it's hoping like, that it's who would fake. believe you too you yeah know? exactly I, it's the thing like people might think you're crazy they might laugh at you it's there's a whole slew of reasons for why they would have felt stuck but i think this was actually it's good timing that i made the red roof joke because <laughs> this was like the final straw for them where it's that night um they literally pack their bags and they run downstairs he rounds up all the kids and kathy they get in the car and the dog and they rush out of the house in the car. They drive to the nearest motel without any hesitation while racing away from the home. The kids recalled that George asked the family to promise them that they would never set foot in that house again. There is something very dark in that home. This is when the story of the hauntings goes beyond the family. So this is like the first time that these 28 days then go public. It's unclear why they decided to do this. But if I had to guess, I would assume they needed the money <laughs> like yeah. to afford to rent rooms, to get out of the home. Um, so they go to the press and they also go to mediums to ask for help. So Channel 5 journalists, as well as famed demonologists, Ed and Lorraine Warren, who are seen in the newer installments of the franchise, because I do not remember them coming into the original movie. Maybe they were there. Were they? 
Why does that name sound familiar? Are they like famous? They're very famous. Okay, okay. Yeah, they're yeah. from they're from the uh, the Conjuring. Uh, conjuring, yeah, the Conjuring okay. universe. Gotcha. Okay. So Ed and Lorraine Warren they sweep into the home. They even invite the family back um, because they felt that that would be good because the, those spirits were familiar with them. It would help them better understand the severity of the hauntings. They could get you know they could recall things. And there were actually several, like, mediums or psychics who would spend time in the home with this family, along with different teams of, like, camera crews, like, people there to record the activity. These events became so severe that in one instance, one of the invited mediums claimed the presence of a dark energy coming from upstairs and then fell extremely ill to the point that they had to be removed from the home. This was then followed by one of the cameramen, who was not, like, a psychic or a medium, that was someone who was there for a gig, suffered what was described as a heart arrhythmia and collapsed to the ground. Like, these happened in sequence at the same time. So to me, I'm like, this goes beyond the families if this was a concoction of stories. Yeah. This is, these are third-party people coming into this home and experiencing something insidious. So whether it's placebo or not, clearly the experiences were not singular to this family. Yeah. It's it's enough to drive, like, anybody out of there it seems like like the second you come in whether it's Mm -hmm. like you said placebo or if it's actual spirit like it gets you so quickly (laughs) like something about that something about the energy at the very least is yeah heavy and dark well it's around this time that i think the news uh the the news (laughs) they (laughs) They put up their um, their televised special covering the hauntings. Because, again, this is only like a year after that very, you know, public headline of the DeFeo murders. Um, and this would regenerate a lot of public interest in the home. And the Lutzes, they realize, like, there is a market for, like, this kind of public interest in the space. So publishers approach the family in consideration of recapping their story of their experiences for a book. This book would be released by 1977 and is what is known as the Amityville Horror. So intimate details of these experiences written within the book made it an instant bestseller. Like, this was a very hot story, and just two years following that publication, the entire story is set to be adopted into a feature film. Now, this is where all of, like, the origin of the discrepancies of the story, I think, are mostly linked to, because the books and the films, as it was confirmed by the family, the publishers took liberties to really dramatize this and, like, like juice the orange for all they could um so this creates a lot of subplots in the story things that the movie touched on that weren't really a part of those 28 days but they wanted to create a true horror movie additional suspicion would fall into the family long after they abandoned the home um and several other families actually bought it and occupied it over the years none of these families ever reported any incidents of paranormal activity which would cast this, like, very heavy shadow of doubt on the family, like the Lutzes, like, with the story that they told. Many believe the entire thing was a scheme developed by George and Kathy in a desperate plea for some quick cash because they jumped on a home they thought they could get for cheap, um, maybe, like, a fixer-upper, like, something they could resell, then realizing they had gone beyond their budget and that they were not going to be able to fix up this home, or even if they could, they weren't going to be able to sell it. They were like, we need some fast money. So we're going to create this story with the kids that the house is haunted (laughs) and then get a book and movie deal. I don't know that anybody thinks like that because it's a pretty like um, grand idea to concoct in 28 days that you're going to go public with a haunting (laughs) of the house you just bought and then (laughs) hope you're going to get a book and movie deal. That does not happen for most haunted houses. Well, and let me tell you, they're real creative with their hauntings. <laughs> like, if I oh were God. coming up they with a be whole, writers, <laughs> I was going to say, if I were coming up with a whole scheme, uh, I would. Well, I would have some sort of a like through line as to what the plot of my like who I think the spirit is and what 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 it's trying to do to me. It kind of made it feel more real that they were all these like scattered types of very creative figures. Yeah, hauntings. Like very, yeah, like, it's more. I would say it's less of like. I don't know, descriptions of the dead family members that they're seeing and more descriptions of, like, demonic figures, honestly. Yeah. Like, the devil with the horns, the pig. I'm never going to be able to get the image of the pig. Out of I can't. Mind. I really That's, can't with the pig. It's so disturbing to me. If I ever saw that, I would die. I would die. 
Do you, well, okay, fear. let's let's touch on this. Why do we think that pigs? Because it is a thing. I think for me, it's the the imagery of it is like that pigs get taken to a slaughterhouse. Normally, I think that's what why it it gives people such an eerie yes. feeling. What where does it come from for you? I have. I think that's exactly it. I have. No, yeah. I mean, maybe this is just like specific to our age because we grew up with so many docs about these. But yeah, I have no positive imagery to associate with a pig. Like I saw Charlotte's <laughs> Web once, honey. Like, <laughs> and even so, isn't that about the pig being? Well, she saves the pig from. Yeah, from she dying. saves the pig. Yes. Yeah, because she's a crafty little spider, and she like yes. <laughs> she writes his name in her web. She's like, you can't. That movie. When spoiler Charlotte dies at the end, beside myself as oh a my child. Oh my god! What a great like book. borderline therapy. Borderline therapy was needed. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not in kidding. the similar vein. I had to almost go to therapy for Chicken Run. I don't know if you remember that movie. No, I do know that movie, but I never saw it. Is it, was, it sad? Yes, it was the same idea of like chickens getting their heads chopped off and there was like a very dark scene where like you can see the shadow of one of the chickens getting its head chopped off oh my god off. And I, I do was remember like, this yes and i was like what in the world like how is this uh, why are animals getting killed why why does that need to be part of like it's it's definitely a theme across storylines for kids can we it's, get i mean it's extremely that? traumatic i think it's yeah. like i mean it's probably our first realization when we're kids that that happens that slaughtering happens because i remember like watching one of those docs i was older with my sister when she was young like she must have been like nine or ten and by that point i was gravely desensitized because i had had the internet for i don't know how many years but my sister watching that with me i'll never forget like turning to her like on my left and she was sobbing yeah at, like nine like she couldn't even fathom that like i think it was about cows it was about cattle she couldn't fathom that that was like what was going on like that's where like meat was coming from it's shocking for little kids so yeah, yeah. i guess like that is a that is a brutal like storyline for most kids to to deal with that would make sense oh <laughs> poor Stu. oh god and and also it was like claymation which that just doesn't need to that's already I creepy i don't need <laughs> claymation chicken slaughters i just don't i don't well they're all oh, they only do claymation movies now for like scary kids movies <laughs> Yeah, it's never it's something true. like happy go lucky. So true, so true. Because <laughs> it's creepy. Well, if the so, Peppa Pig Peppa horror Pig. movie comes out and it's in claymation, I'm suing you. <laughs> I also think okay. So my other insidious imagery with um, a pig head is from The Village, which I think we've talked about before, which you've never oh, seen, yes, right? Yes, have yes, you seen yes, that? Yes, I have not, but I know what you're talking about. Yes. So the creatures, like the ten foot tall creatures that come to the village, like every day. The face is of like a hog head. It's like a decaying hog head. So, I don't know what it is about pigs. I I appreciate them. They're very smart. They're extremely smart. But they're scary. Yeah. (laughs) It's a hog. It's scary. (laughs) We're going to have some creepers who have pet pigs who are like... I know, I know. I did. It's a wrap on you kids. (laughs) It's a wrap. (laughs) I will say, I did have a friend in college who had a pet pig. And it was the cutest thing I had ever seen. I think pigs are so cute, like actually in real life. It's it's more in like they are. They get such a bad. Can we like we need to like represent pigs? We need to. <laughs> that is going to be my they cause. Squeal. The squealing is like very yes, alarming is to the, the yes. ear of a person, which is why I think we associate like, and it comes out of nowhere. So we associate them with like shocking imagery or like yes. I don't know audio senses. But I also had someone. I knew in high school who had a teacup pig, and it was ridiculous and adorable. It They're was just so showing cute. like lay on its back. But this pig was scary in the Amityville Horror. That's I don't need a pig with red eyes looking no, at me through I don't, my window. I don't. I don't. I don't. But I've like, got enough to deal with pigs. in LA. <laughs> <laughs> I just really don't need that. No, you don't. <laughs> so let's get back on track with what's going on in their world, George and Kathy. So. They are challenged on the legitimacy of all of their experience. They're like, all of these critics, the skeptics, they're like, you stayed in the house for one month. You made all this up. Um, But they contest this and they actually separately agree to take polygraph tests in 1979 regarding all of the stories they told. To the shock of their critics, and this changed a lot of opinions and I think why the franchise lives on, both of them passed with 100% clearance that everything they told was apparently true. 
that's surprising to me. That's Everything. wild. Yeah. So what I also found interesting, um, like in the pursuit of like confirmation of the stories was that if it was like, if it was real or was it a hoax, um, the eldest Daniel, he eventually like goes on for like a sit down interview. I think in 2012, he's in his forties and George has already died. Apparently he has no affection for George. Like he described his stepfather as very abusive. He did not mourn his death. This would have been a very interesting and like clear opportunity where this kid could discredit him say like his father or his stepfather rather was fabricating the whole thing and despite having this distaste for him and his abuse obviously he does not do that he said they were not coaxed into anything as kids he said everything that happened in that house was real everything that was happening was actually happening but he thinks george was more involved than most people know so he actually goes on to make an even darker claim that the experiences started before they moved into the house and that George himself as a person was someone who was privately interested in the occult and was privately practicing black magic and trying to summon demons. He sought that house out specifically for that reason. So Daniel described an experience when he was a child of spying on George in private and seeing him levitate a wrench to his hand without touching it he believes that george came to that home with the intention of contacting spirits or summoning something even more evil within that space now whether you believe it or not i mean i guess that would sort of make sense if this was specific to george and what he was doing if he was practicing a black magic like daniel describes that would make sense in the context of once the family leaves all of this kind of stops in the home you know, like maybe the yeah. home was like a hotbed for mining that kind of energy. But then the families that followed them that moved in, they said, we didn't experience anything. We just don't know how, how legit any of this story was that's coming from Daniel about the black magic and George being, you know, obsessed with, you know, resurrecting demons or anything like that. And although the home, like I said, is reported without activity to this day, whatever happened in the 70s. It has been corroborated by many people who went to visit it. And those polygraph tests, they stand the test of time. Something dark went on within those walls. And Stu, that is all I have for you. Oh my god, I think it's 10 a.m. on the dot. That is all I have for you on the story of the Amityville Horror. What are your thoughts on that? Well, thank God we did this in the morning. Because if if we had done this at night, I would be really, really freaked out. That would be cruel. I could never. I know. I'll Um, reserve the paranormal cases for the morning. I just, I, I really want to know like more about George's backstory because I feel like it's very Mm. bizarre to, I'm going to look it up right now. Yeah. Like it's very bizarre for, I I hate to like generalize, but like for the father figure to be like interested in, you know, like black magic or whatever. Like Mm -hmm. I just, I, I don't know. Like you don't really hear of that very often. Like sometimes, and, and. I hate this for women because I feel like it's usually a narrative that's like spun out of, you know, her having too much time on her hands being a stay at home mom. But like normally it's like the mother kind of goes into a little bit of a if it it has something to do with like witchery or like, yeah, like black magic. Yeah. Yeah. I feel like you don't really hear often like the father being the one that's like. You definitely hear of like the dad going crazy or violent, but you know what this is, Stu? This is inherited <laughs> trauma from the witch trials. It's going past generations to us. Oh my like, gosh! It's usually the women that a hundred percent get into 100%. the devil. <laughs> it's true. Um, yeah. So, like, I'm just very curious about like who he was as a person, what his backstory so was. It says here that Lutz was a former land surveyor. I don't know what that actually entails but he was a land surveyor he always struck me in the movies maybe this is just how they depicted him as like a very blue collar guy yes yeah um he did not he didn't live too old he died when he was 59 um and i guess like his career after this did change to like being a writer because this was not the only book that was ever published on the amityville horrors but i don't know like a blue yeah a blue collar guy like land surveyor these are pretty creative stories but also you're right. That is strange. Like he doesn't fit the profile I have in my mind of somebody who's getting into devil worship or somebody who's dabbling with black magic. But apparently there are books or something. There was like some 
tangible piece of evidence, like proof that he was into this, like he was interested in it. And I guess it's possible. Okay, I do it's have actually... to say, oh, go yeah. ahead. I mean, this is not any any point of relevance, but I'm looking at old pictures of George, and I'm like, damn, they really did like make him pretty damn hot in the movies. <laughs> He's so <laughs> substantially course. hotter in We've the films; that, it's ridiculous. We, I know we see that all the time in horror movies. It's not yeah. good, not the greatest. <laughs> um, that's so interesting that he was a Lancer Bear because that that would mean that he kind of. He knows a lot about like properties and stuff. So when they went to go buy that house, I mean, I'm sure he wasn't. I don't know. I feel like there's something else there. There's there's more to that than mm-hmm. meets the eye. Well, what are your final thoughts on it? Do you believe that there is some truth to the hauntings of the Amityville horror, or do you think it was a conspiracy concocted by a family? <sighs> I mean, it just it. it it feels like it was a little bit concocted because of the the knowing that they were in financial kind of not they weren't in financial trouble i guess but they had definitely overbought they they yeah. were going to be at some point probably they were spread thin spread thin um yeah. so and because of just how fast it all kind of happened it almost mm-hmm. feels like they bought the house realized very quickly that they were going to be in deep you know what and they were like we got to figure out a way to get out of this um and especially because nobody else has had those experiences Mm -hmm. it does kind of give me pause um hoaxy vibes it gives me hope gives me hoaxy vibes um something is cattywampus here i I don't know something something ain't right (laughs) well what about the so what are your thoughts on the polygraph tests with kathy and george both separately passing you know that is really i guess like the one crux here but i almost feel like can i mean you can pass a polygraph pretty you can i guess it's not pretty easily um i don't know or maybe that you believe your own myth so much that you can pass it is that a possibility? I think poly- well, from everything I've read about polygraphs, I haven't read a ton, but you're actually more likely to fail even if you're telling the truth. Like your your failure rate is exponentially higher than your success rate of passing. Yeah. Okay. Um, because nerves take over. So it's it's very – that's why they're considered and still kind of used today. It's very rare that even if someone's um, – it's very rare that someone can pass it if they're lying, right? Like, because there are so many instances, like I'm saying, of people even telling the truth on a polygraph and the results are still inconclusive or they're a failure. They're that sensitive. So it's shocking yeah. to me that they individually could pass the polygraph test when being questioned on all of these experiences, like the demon in the room, the demon in the fireplace, the, the pig. Oh, I'm never going to get into that <laughs> damn pig. The damn pig. Okay, you know what? As I'm sitting here thinking... I forgot about the dog and you know how I feel about dogs. They pick up mm-hmm. on energies. They pick up on. Well, that could have been a story too. I mean, uh, yeah, cause that true. all came from like him. So I'm, I'm like, the, the dog didn't take a polygraph. I don't think <laughs> <laughs> but... Yeah. Also very easy to like point to the one thing that can't talk back. And exactly. you yeah. Yeah. Your one story. witness is nonverbal. I love yeah. that. <laughs> Well, also, none of the kids seem to, like, deny anything later in life, like I said. So that also is a point of of interest where you're like, okay, well, it seems like nobody's really breaking in this story. And I understand what you're saying, though. It's like, maybe it's far-fetched to think that they entered the scheme thinking, like, we're going to make a lot of money out of it. But they do eventually go on to make a lot of money. I would say this is one of the most successful like real life stories that was sold to the like they sold the rights to a franchise cases like in history like they made a substantial amount of money off of this story but yeah i mean they abandoned the home i don't even actually know what ended up happening with the sale maybe after it became famous there was somebody who was interested in buying it so yeah they broke even I wonder and made who their money back owns it now or when it was last on the market 1112 ocean ave Going to redfin.com. <laughs> Just Lots zillowing of... the Amityville Horror House. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, that's insane. You know what actually just went up for sale, which I forgot to mention to you on one of our last episodes. Is it the Jean Benet House? Jean Benet Ramsey House. Jean I, Benet I was House. just yeah. going to say, I saw that. I saw that. Which is stunning inside. It's beautiful. Yeah. And th- I could not believe this, but they like refinished the basement and had pictures of it. That threw me up against a wall. I saw it. I was like, I know. This is- 
dark, dark and scary. So, so dark. And also like the finishings were like, it's, it's like a man's cave now. It's like leather couches, <laughs> like just so weird to look at those pictures. Oh, okay. So this home sold in 2016. Oh, wait, no, no. It was listed in 2016, sold by March of 2017 um, for 605000 which still seems pretty low. I'm not super familiar with, like, the property values in Long Island, but this is a pretty nice house. That seems very oh. low. Yeah, I'm looking inside right now. Whoever decorated it, it's, it's hideous. Jesus Christ. <laughs> they should have got us. Like, it's truly, like horrible horrible decor um oh it's so weird to see like modern things in this home knowing the history like tvs and stuff it's strange interesting does it say anything about who like the profile of who bought it um (laughs) if i had to guess they seem (laughs) they i mean just from the decor they seem much older amityville Subsequent died in prison. Let's see. 1112 Ocean Ave. Oh, they oh, so they changed the name of it. So the, whoever did buy it did not want it to be known as the Amityville House. So they actually got permission from the city to change the house number to 108. So it would deter tourists. But obviously the visual of the home is so recognizable that it would take two seconds to be right. like, that's the house. Um, Let's see. What else is there here? 605,000. The post has reached out to the current owners for comment. Scroll through to read more. Okay, thank you. <laughs> okay, I'm looking now to you. This article. I mean, it's a beautiful house when you look at it on the inside. I mean, I still get despite a pit the in decor. my stomach. <laughs> I, I know the, the decor is truly like something insidious in and of itself, but I get a pit in my stomach looking at it. Um, I see the boathouse. Yeah, it's really the boathouse that gets me. That yeah, that's scary. Um, this article totally baited me because there is no additional information about the owner. Damn, but somebody owns it. Somebody got that house. Did they film the movie? No, they couldn't have filmed the movie in the house. I. But what were the? Did they film? Was it a set? Like what were the exterior shots? I bet you I they filmed it in some other like part of Long Island or something where like similar houses are. Interesting. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, it's what, definitely still there. What do you think? Do you think it's real? If it's not, this is quite the elaborate scheme. And I'm not saying that people aren't capable of drumming up elaborate schemes, but it is so detailed. It is so rock solid. Like, there seems to be no one, like, no weak link who is, like, broken to be like, yeah. like at least with the Enfield Poltergeist, there was a lot of, like, doubt because... There were, like, verifiable incidents of, like, proving that this was a hoax or, like, that girls were, like, the girls were fabricating stuff. Like, this doesn't seem to be that. You know what I mean? Like, I'm not finding a lot of holes in this story. And I'll say, I've said it before, I'll say it again. The pig head is too specific. (laughs) Nobody, I have never, ever, ever read of a ghost story where somebody, people always say, like, I saw a figure, I saw a woman in, like, old clothing. Nobody has ever described seeing a pig's head. Yeah. Ever. And it's like so coming original. from the child. Yeah. Well, Ka- I mean, Kathy was the one who saw it. Well, yeah. Ka- or you're right. Missy said she had Jody as the friend. Yeah. That Jody was the pig, which is strange. Nobody has an imaginary friend who's a pig. That's abnormal. exactly. It's just weird. And then Kathy seeing it and George seeing it. And Kathy recalls that experience too. Kathy also, or sorry, not Kathy. Missy also saw it even at five. She remembers it. So there's three touch points of confirmation that make me think something went down in this house. I do think the overall story has been deeply exaggerated purely from the book and the movie franchise, which I don't think had anything to do with George and Kathy, really. I think that they gave over the rights. Publishers took creative liberties and people wanted to sell books. They wanted to sell tickets. Yeah. But I buy it. I buy it. I really, uh, oh, I wish I still lived in New York because, like, I would totally, like, take the train up and just do a day. If you ever visited me, we could t- go up there and see it. Oh, God, that would be so eerie. I can't take that. <laughs> I'm Don't on worry. I'll a get us fi- room with a... the red roof. I was like, please, please. <laughs> <laughs> Which is arguably just as haunted. <laughs> yeah. Um, I 
I'm on Fandom right now, which is one of my favorite websites. It's like an even it's like a juicier Wikipedia. Um, they have a lot of interesting information and insight on here that I wish I I wish I saw. I'm trying to figure out what these Oh, okay. These are like the the records of like how much people paid for the home. Okay, so I guess when the DeFeos bought it, they paid thirty thousand. That was in nineteen sixty five, so I guess that makes sense. And then the Lutzes paid eighty thousand. And then when was the next sale? Oh wow. Okay, so the Lutzes left by nineteen seventy six. Um because they were there between December eighteenth to January fourteenth. And then the next people who bought it bought it by March eighteenth, nineteen seventy seven, so just a year later. So the Cromarties. So that's also a point of um, contention I have too, is that even if the Lutzes made this up, for them to go a year of paying that mortgage, because mortgages don't stop just because a house is haunted, but yeah. also paying to live somewhere else, their book deal didn't even come, I think for another two years or something after the haunting. So they weren't like riding high off the, the financial gain of any of this. They were like paying out the ass for years yeah, I guess unless this unless they were getting paid to do like press and interviews and stuff, which it seemed like I they were pretty they were. willing they, they, to they like were. talk to the news about it. Um, I don't know. It is currently owned. So then eventually the people who bought it after had it for 10 years and then they sold it to the O'Neills in 1987 for 325000 and they had it for another 10 years. And then Brian Wilson, a single man, bought the home in 1997 and has kept it ever since. So he is responsible for that damn decor. <laughs> well, a, <laughs> the most a, a hideous single man, display a single man home. you can't trust him. <laughs> I, can't. I don't think you can trust Buying a single man. a six-bedroom man. mansion, no. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and decorate it to the nines. Good. But yeah, that is it, Stu. That is the Amityville horror hauntings thank you so much for doing a paranormal episode this was oh i love it wait was this my first paranormal was it oh i think it might have been yeah oh my gosh (gasps) Stu, and it was the amityville horror case a highly requested case i know Um, i'm I'm, I'm oh my gosh have we ever done paranormal i don't think we have done any paranormal stuff ever so um oh nahani valley yes i was gonna say that the nahani valley i guess was sort of paranormal but this is like a true like haunt like and within I think it's something so different when it's like a haunted house. I mean, that's just mm-hmm. like classic haunting. We haven't done anything like that, really. No, we totally haven't. And it's from the 70s, which I know is an era that you love. love. So that made me excited last night, too. I real quick before I close this out, I had like um, a presentation recently from uh, who was it? A&E, I think. And they were talking about like upcoming programming because they own a lot of channels they own like the history network and they own like lifetime freeform um actually i don't know if they own freeform but they have a lot and the history channel they have a whole genre within that that's all like mystery and like the occult and they have a new series coming out called it's a docu-series called the bermuda triangle cursed waters where they are (gasps) sending teams out to the bermuda triangle like camera crews I cannot think of a worse idea that has ever been drummed up no. by a TV network. <laughs> like a reality show? Or, or it's, like it's a, it's like a docuseries? I think like Ghost Hunter style. Like okay. they're going out in search of like, what are the legends of the Bermuda Triangle? It's like, don't go. Just don't. <laughs> <laughs> Hold off. <laughs> if they called you and said, can you come out and shoot like a day where you explore. Stu. <laughs> I can't even go do? to like haunted house. First of all, Parapod Festival was a lot for me to go to the Mentryville houses. That was a lot. You think <gasps> I'm getting on a boat and going to the Bermuda <laughs> Triangle? Oh, I'm. I if, would sooner die. If they die. do, you better tell me and I'm dragging your ass and we're going. <laughs> we'll be swallowed whole. That's oh so God. scary. <laughs> I, I mean, I'll certainly promote it. I'm happy to promote I'm promoting the show right now. But <laughs> Oh, my God. <laughs> It, I miss. Like, I the love crap Ghost out of Hunters. Me. I love that I show. I did too. Ugh. Jack was on the last episode, and he like resurrected this memory for me because Zach um, Bagan or Bagan Bagan, I think is how you pronounce it, was the uh-huh. host of Ghost Hunters, and Jack was like, "God, he was so hot," and I was like, <laughs> "Was he?" And then I looked up old pictures, and I was like, "Wait a second, he kind of was in like a very like ghost hunt, like 
he's clearly like he gives the visual experience of a ghost hunter like the jet black dyed hair the black t-shirt he's got like the little earrings i'm like yeah this guy's a ghost hunter for sure definitely vegas coded um but yeah he had some arms he was fit back in the day well i guess that explains why i used to binge watch it on discovery channel <laughs> <laughs> unpack unpacking the truth with Stu. truly oh my gosh we well, still Stu, thank you need so much to do some sort of oh <gasps> yes we still need to do something yeah, like a ghost do. experience we, yeah we have to i was gonna close this out i was gonna thank you because you have indulged me with a full hour of horror and fans and i could not thank you more oh thank um, you i'm in desperate need of a sunday morning java so i am getting coffee immediately after yes, this to calm yes, my nerves so do i but Creepers, thank you so much for joining in. And thank you again, Creepers, for all of your patience on my Friday de- debacle. I promise I won't do it again. But Stu is so lovely and so forgiving and was nice enough to do this on a Sunday morning. On um, Mother's Day. <laughs> I know, on Mother's Day. <laughs> so thank you so much for doing that, Stu. I appreciate yeah. it, Creepers. Oh, absolutely. We are going to catch you next week. We'll hear you on another episode or you'll hear us on another episode. We'll say goodbye. Yes, and happy Bye, Mother's Day to all of our Creeper moms. <sighs> Happy Mother's Day, Creeper Moms. We hope you had a great listen. Enjoy your day. It's your day. (laughs) Bye.